ever get that feeling. Like something's missing. Like you're baking, but the cookies just won't rise. Missing that key ingredient. Exactly. And in the world of continuous improvement, that missing ingredient is often training. So today we're diving into continuous improvement and training. By Wallace, Hybert, and Nicker McCulley. You got it. And let me tell you, these authors are not messing around. What I appreciate right off the bat is they don't treat training like an afterthought. Right. It's not just a box to check. Yeah. It's fundamental. It's like they compare it to skipping maintenance on a brand new car. Oh, I love that analogy. Like you've got this powerful engine raring to go. All that potential. But if you don't take care of it, boom, breakdown. And this chapter, it doesn't just stop at that basic connection. They go deep on building a culture of continuous improvement. Okay, so let's unpack this whole culture thing a little later. Sure. But first, I love how they break down these three levels of improvement. Yeah. Each with its own, shall we say, training flavor. They use the example of a chemical plant, but honestly, this applies across industries. Absolutely. So at the job level, we're talking like small tweaks. Yeah. The things people on the ground figure out to make their work smoother. Exactly. Like an operator, maybe they find a faster way to, I don't know, sort materials. Training there might be as simple as a quick chat. Right. Or like a sticky note added to the process docs. Exactly. Then we bump it up to the process level. Things get a little more explosive. Well, hopefully not literally, <laughs> but definitely more complex. True, true. Think of a chemical engineer tweaking a formula, trying to get a better yield. Or maybe they're streamlining a whole production sequence. Now we're talking. Now you need new skills, deeper knowledge, yeah. probably some formal training sessions. Right. It's like mastering toast. That's job level. But then you want to get fancy. Right. Learning about sourdough versus rye, different toasting techniques. Oh, yeah. That's process level. You're upping your bread game. I like it. <laughs> and then system level. Hit me. You're designing the whole bakery. Wow. This is cross-functional teams revolutionizing entire systems. That requires comprehensive training. Everything from teamwork to high-level problem solving. Okay, so speaking of tools for problem solving, there's this amazing table in the chapter. Oh, yeah. Table 4-2, I think. Okay. It lays out all these different training methods, like a menu. Oh, I like that. You can pick the perfect approach. Love it. From on-the-job coaching to, like, interactive CBT. It's really cool. It really drives home the point Wait. that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Right. You got to consider the complexity who's involved, even the company culture. And that's where I think the author's focus on culture really comes into play. They highlight this engineer, Lee Moore. Okay. He managed to like weave CI training throughout his whole organization. Wow. It's fascinating. He didn't just create a few workshops. He built what they call a curriculum architecture. Curriculum architecture <laughs> sounds very official. Right. But it's a powerful idea. Yeah. Essentially, it's a roadmap for CI training. It maps out long-term training needs, yeah. make sure training aligns with the company's goals. Smart. And critically, it bakes in continuous evaluation and improvement. Just like any process, your training has to be refined over time to stay effective. Absolutely. So we've established training pretty essential for a successful CI. But this chapter, it goes way beyond that. Okay. It dives into how to build effective training programs. And get this, they compare it to engineering a product. Makes sense. Right. You wouldn't rush a product launch without design, testing, refinement. No way. Training needs that same kind of rigor. Absolutely. The chapter outlines the six-phase process for training development. And guess what? It all starts for, with... Don't tell me. Continuous improvement. That's the laughs figures. Right. It's everywhere. Okay, so phase one. Project planning and kickoff. This is about getting everyone on the same page from the start. Absolutely. Defining the scope, assembling the A-team. Yeah, and critically, that includes representatives from the people who are actually going to be receiving the training. Oh, good point. Get their input right from the get-go. Love it. And for this phase, having a realistic timeline, that's huge. Because neglecting this phase is like building a house on sand. Oof. Recipe for disaster. You're setting yourself up for delays, blown budgets. And probably a training program that totally misses the mark. 100%. The chapter really stresses having this detailed project plan. Yeah, makes sense. Outline each step, every responsibility, all the key decision points. You've got to have that solid foundation. Okay, so you've laid that foundation. Now it's on to phase two, analysis. This is where we put on our detective hats. Ooh, I like it. 
We got to understand the who just as much as the what of the training. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to know your audience inside and out. Yeah. Existing skills, knowledge gaps. Right. And those specific outcomes you're aiming for. Because what resonates with, say, a seasoned engineer totally different might fall completely flat with frontline workers completely the authors actually provide this helpful little framework figure four or five for capturing all this data and then prioritizing training needs really useful stuff okay so we've got our plan we've analyzed our audience time to unleash the creativity here we go phase three Design. This is where we actually start building the training program, yeah? Picking our tools from that training method menu we talked about. It is. Think of it like designing a house, right? You're deciding on the style. I like where you're going with this. Is this a cozy, like, workshop kind of vibe? Or a high-tech online course? Wow. Or maybe a blend of both? You're choosing your materials, Ooh. videos, hands-on activities, group discussions. And then, importantly, you're defining what success looks like. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. How will you measure if the training is actually working? Exactly. Because this is where that word robustness comes up again, right? For sure. Yeah. Remember, with CI, it's all about continuous improvement. Right. And your training, it has to keep pace. The authors talk about designing for what they call, get this, training abilities. Training abilities. Yeah. It's like giving your training program superpowers. Okay, I'm intrigued. Give me these superpowers. So effectiveness, obviously. Deliverability. Makes sense. But also updatability. Can it evolve as your needs change? And of course, affordability. Oh, right. Got to be realistic. Can't break the bank. Love the training openies. Yeah, it's a good one. So we're not just building a training program. We're engineering it for the long haul. Exactly. And just like any good engineer, you've got to test your prototype. Which brings us to phase four, development. Okay. This is where you create those training materials, the actual content, yeah. all the activities we talked about. So going from blueprints to like bricks and mortar. Precisely. Yeah. And again, collaboration is key here. Of course. Bring in those subject matter experts yeah. and critically get the people who will actually be delivering the training involved. Oh, that's smart. You get that real world feedback. Make sure the training is both engaging and effective. Love it. Okay. So we've got our prototype training program, feedback from the trenches, time for a test drive, phase five, pilot test. Let her rip. This is where you let a small select group Take the training for a spin. Okay. See how it flows. Identify any rough edges. Right. Refine the content. You make sure it hits those learning objectives <laughs> before you roll it out to everyone. Okay, so we've planned, analyzed, designed, developed, and test-driven our training program. We're ready to launch this thing right, full speed ahead. Ooh, whoa, hold your horses there, speed racer. Yeah. We've got one crucial phase left. Phase six, revision and release. Oh, right, right. Got to incorporate that feedback from the pilot test. Exactly. Even the most meticulously designed training. It's going to need some tweaks. Of course. After that pilot test, you're going to have even better insights. Yeah. You're maximizing effectiveness, engagement, before you launch it to the wider organization. It's like fine-tuning a race car after those initial test laps. Love it. Make sure it's really humming. Exactly. So we wouldn't release a software update without squashing those last few bugs, right? Never. Got to make sure it's smooth, user-friendly. Same idea here. 100%. Yeah. And just like with software, you need a system for managing those revisions. Oh, that's a good point. Make sure everyone's using the latest and greatest version of the training. Right. This chapter talks about clear documentation, version control, music to an engineer's ears. Music to any organized person's ears, honestly. But let's be real for a sec. Even the best laid plans, they can go a little sideways. Oh, tell me about it. Did the authors give us any real world examples of like how to handle those messy, unpredictable moments? Because we all know those happen. They do. Remember our CI training hero, Lee Moore? Oh, yeah, yeah. They actually dive into his experience at GPT Manufacturing. It's this fantastic case study designing and implementing a company-wide CI training program. Okay, spill the tea. What were his secrets to success? Well, first off, he knew the power of a strong team. Okay. He put together a steering committee, got all the key stakeholders in the room, senior management, okay. the folks on the front lines. Love it. He wanted to make sure that training program had buy-in and support from every level. Smart move, because lack of support from the top, that can sink a training program faster than you can say process improvement. Oh, 100%. Oh, 
And more didn't stop there. He made sure that the training content was rooted in the realities of GPT's needs and challenges, involved subject matter experts from different departments, did a really thorough needs analysis, even customized some off-the-shelf training materials oh, wow. to reflect GPT's unique lingo and processes. I love that. It's like tailoring a suit. You wouldn't expect a one-size-fits-all to fit everyone perfectly. Exactly. A generic <laughs> one-size-fits-all training program. Yeah. Let's, well, let's just say not a recipe for success. Point taken. <laughs> So he customized the content, but then he also made sure the delivery methods matched GPT's culture and resources. Exactly. Yeah. Because he realized a super interactive classroom heavy approach. Yeah. While effective in some cases, it wasn't going to be feasible or scalable across all 10 of GPT's manufacturing plants. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. So he went for more of a blended learning approach. Okay. Incorporated classroom elements on-the-job coaching, nice. even self-paced online modules. Oh, very nice. So people could learn on their own time at their own pace. Exactly. Yeah. This way, the training was adaptable to different learning styles, job roles, locations. Smart. So it sounds like Moore really had it all figured out, but I'm guessing there were still a few bumps along the way. Oh, of course. Yeah. It wouldn't be a good story without a few plot twists. Exactly. What were some of the challenges he faced? And how did he overcome them? Give us the real behind-the-scenes story. One of the biggest hurdles, honestly, simply getting everyone on board with this whole idea of continuous improvement training. Remember, this wasn't just a one-off workshop. Moore was talking about weaving CI training into the very fabric of GPT's culture. That's a huge shift. A huge change. I mean, how do you even begin to convince people to embrace that kind of change? Well, Moore, he was smart about it. He focused on the why. Okay. He made sure everyone from the factory floor to the C-suite understood the reasons behind this training. Right. It wasn't just about checking some box. Yeah. Yeah. It was about, you know, improving quality, reducing waste. Yeah. Boosting efficiency, making GPT more competitive. Oh, he connected it back to the bottom line. Exactly. Hmm? He didn't just tell them what to do. He explained why it mattered to their work. To GPT success. Get people invested in the process, not just going through the motion. 100%. Yeah. And to do that, you've got to connect with people on a deeper level. Okay, I like that. Show them how the training benefits not just the company, but their own skills, their own career growth. Right, it's an investment in them. But even with the best intentions, I'm sure there were times when, you know, Moore's grand training plan slammed right into the reality of day-to-day -day operation. Oh, for sure. What happened when things didn't go according to the script? Well, one of the biggest challenges, honestly, just finding the time for training. Oh, I bet. Everyone was already juggling busy schedules, especially in that kind of fast-paced manufacturing environment. I mean, remember that plant foreman we talked about? Oh, yeah. Laser focused on productivity. Exactly. Maximizing uptime, minimizing downtime. Probably not a fan of slowing things down for some training session. Not really his jam. <laughs> so more, he had to get creative. Okay. He worked with supervisors to find those little pockets of time that could be dedicated to training. Maybe it was during shift changes, lunch breaks, even before or after work. Huh. He also tapped into online modules, self-paced materials. Right. So people could learn on their own time at their own pace. Talk about flexibility. There's yeah. that saying, right? Be like water. Ooh, I like that. The best training programs, they adapt. For sure. You got to flow around those obstacles. Exactly. And, you know, Moore's ability to adapt, to find those workarounds, that was key to his success. It wasn't always easy, but by being flexible, resourceful, and persistent, he really created a training program that took root at GPT. And that's a great takeaway from this whole chapter. Implementing CI training, it's not a one and done. It's a journey. Continuous learning, continuous improvement. Couldn't agree more. It's like building a muscle. One gym session won't get you ripped. You need that consistent effort over time. Exactly. And just like a good workout routine, a successful CI training program, it requires the right equipment. Right. Those different training methods we talked about. You got it. Plus, a little coaching, a commitment to ongoing development. Then you're really cooking with gas. This deep dive, it has been a workout for our brains. We explored some pretty intriguing concepts. We compared training to oil changes. Don't forget about the bakery. Oh, right. And who could forget the bakery? We designed our dream training menus. We even uncovered the secrets of curriculum architecture. It's been quite a ride. It has. And this chapter is packed with even more insights, practical tips. Oh, for sure. But if there's one thing I want our listeners to take away from all of this, it's this. 
training. It's not just a box to be ticked on your CI to-do list. It's the fuel that drives continuous improvement, the foundation that a culture of learning and growth is built upon. Beautifully said. Couldn't agree more. And speaking of foundations, the authors, they leave us with this final thought-provoking question. They compare investing in training to investing in capital equipment. Interesting. Think about it. You wouldn't buy some sophisticated piece of machinery without an operator's manual, a regular maintenance schedule. Absolutely not. That's just asking for trouble. <laughs> so then why on earth would you implement CI without an equally robust training strategy? That's something to chew on, folks. How can you champion this kind of strategic thinking in your own organization? How can you help others see training not as an expense, but as a vital investment in continuous improvement, long-term success? Until next time, keep those CI wheels turning. Thank you.